Good morning, Dallas. Thank you for being here on this Pentecost Sunday as we celebrate and worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The announcements were in the email that went out this week. I do have a name that we need to lift up in prayer. We've been asked to remember Don Britton as he is awaiting results for a biopsy for possible cancer in his tongue. And he will have a PET scan Monday to check his lymph nodes. So please add Don Britton to your prayer list. Thank you for being with us tonight, today, for taking time out of your schedule to be here with us and worship our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Got a question for you. If you think of the word pizzazz, do you think of any particular person? Who is a person that you know that just adds pizzazz everywhere they go? Today, that's what we're going to talk about as we talk about passing the salt. At this time, let us bow our heads for a quick word of prayer. Lord, thank you for this worship service. Thank you that we are here and that we are able to worship you. May the words that are sung, read, or spoken today Speak to us in a special way. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Now, may we pray. Dear Heavenly Father, in the silence of this moment, call us by name. Lift our weary spirits, deepen our questioning faith, and give us new eyes to see your blessings all around us. For you are the giver of peace, the source of our joy, and a whisper of love in the stillness. How blessed we are to have you in our lives, to live in a country that we can worship you openly. Bring us into one mind and one spirit, that this service will be received the way you need it to be, in order to teach us what we need to learn. As this pandemic has affected all of us, we want to continue to pray for those who are trying to keep us safe all the people on the front line, the doctors, the nurses, the first responders. We pray for our government, our president, the governors, and all the ones that are making new laws and rules for us to live by. We praise you that we no longer have to live by works and laws to get to heaven. And we thank you for the grace through Jesus Christ. So much is going on in our lives, our country, and this world. Please keep us focused that we continue to seek your will in our lives. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. is what our 
comes from Matthew chapter 5 verses 13 through 16. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and pull it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before man that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
There's a little old Christian lady who lived next to an atheist. Every morning the woman would come out her front door on her front porch, look up to the heavens and say, Thank you, Lord. Praise the Lord. And the atheist would always yell back at her, There is no God. She does this every morning and the same result. Now as time went on, the, the lady kind of had trouble making ends meet and she needed some food. So she goes out on her front porch and she looks up to the heavens and she says, Thank you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. I need some food. Can you help me? Well, the next morning she goes out on her front porch and, and there's the groceries that she needed so bad. And she looks at them, looks up in the sky and says, Thank you, Lord. Praise the Lord. Well, the atheist, he jumped out from behind the bush and says, Ha! I bought those groceries for you. There is no God. The lady stops, looks at him, smiles, looks up to the heavens and says, Praise the Lord, not only did you provide for me, but you made the devil pay for these groceries too. I have to wonder sometimes, do we identify with Christ where we are? Do we identify with Christ? Do people know that we are believers where you live, where you work, where you play? Do people in your workplace know that you claim to be a Christian? Does your barber know that? Does your beautician know it? Do the folks that sit beside you at the ball games know it? Or do the officials know that you are a Christian? In today's scripture, Jesus paid his disciples and us a supreme compliment. He said, you are the salt of the earth. Even today, if you hear someone being referred to as the salt of the earth, that is a good compliment. You've talked about how worthy and how useful that person is. Now notice in this verse, Jesus did not say you are to become the salt of the earth. And he didn't say you are capable of being the salt of the earth. No, he said you are the salt of the earth. You see, folks, when any person is in Christ, when any person is committed to Christ, connected to Christ, then that person is salty. And man, what a compliment this is. Salt was one of the most prized commodities of the first century. As a matter of fact, Roman soldiers were paid part of their salary in salt. Really, that's where the word salary comes from. It's a derivative of the Latin word for salt. A soldier's salary was cut if he was not worth his salt. A phrase that came into being when the Greeks and Romans used that phrase often to buy slaves with salt. Of all the roads that led to Rome, one of the busiest was the Via Salara, the, the salt route, they called it. Roman soldiers would march up and down that street. Merchants would go up and down that path too with carts full of salt. And during the Middle Ages, the sanctity of salt slid towards superstition. It was a matter of fact, it was said that the spilling of salt was considered a foretelling of doom. Now, it was interesting to me that if you look in Leonardo da Vinci's painting of the Last Supper, and you find Judas, if you look really close, right in front of Judas, is an overturned salt shaker right in front of him. And also in, in the biblical case, salt at one time symbolized a lack of faithfulness. In the book of Genesis chapter 19, two angels come and they command Lot and his wife and two daughters to, to flee from that sinful city of Sodom and to not ever look back. Well, you know the story, Lot's wife, she, she cast a, a glance back, said because her faith was uncertain. And she was transformed into a pillar of salt. Now in order for us to understand exactly what Jesus means here, we need to talk about some of the uses of salt. First, salt was used as a preservative. As you know, in first century Palestine, there was no refrigeration. They would catch fish, and the only way that they could keep the fish fresh was with salt. Even today, you go to the store and you buy a Virginia ham, a lot of those are preserved with salt too. I believe where you have salty Christians, spoilage or corruption will decrease. Where salt is scarce, then sin and toxicity will abound. 
Our churches today, we need more salty Christians. The Christian Communications Laboratory relates the story of a small Midwestern weekly paper which ran a story sometime back saying, we are pleased to announce that the tornado that blew away the Methodist church last Friday did no real damage to the town. Did no real damage to the town. I don't know about you, but I like football. One of my favorite pregame shows is the one that's on Fox. And, and Terry Bradshaw, I think he, he is someone who certainly brings pizzazz, but I'll never forget the first show they did after 9-11, Terry Bradshaw pulled out the Bible. And he sat there and he said, it's times like this that we turn to what is important in our life. And then he spoke of the 23rd Psalm. We need more people today who's out in front of folks pulling out the Bible, passing the salt, if you will, into a tasteless world. In the book of Leviticus, we read, With all thine offerings thou shalt offer salt. Now because of its use as a preservative, salt became a, a token of permanence for the Jews in the Old Testament. And it's used in Hebrew sacrifices as a meat purifier. And that came to signify the eternal covenant between God and Israel. An interesting story in the Old Testament, Testament with Sephra and Pua. They're two Old Testament women that literally saved or preserved our Christian history. Now I can almost guarantee you that these two ladies, they, they'll never end up on your short list of easily recognized biblical characters. As a matter of fact, some of you may be thinking right now, he's made these two up. But you see, the nation of Israel and us, we owe them a debt of gratitude. You see, Shifra and Pua were two of the midwives assigned to attend to the Israelite women during childbirth in the years preceding the Exodus. You may remember from the book of Exodus that during the time of Joseph, the Israelites enjoyed favor before Pharaoh and his court. And then a new Pharaoh came. As the Israelites' population increased, the Egyptians became afraid of the Israelites. And, and they were afraid that not only are they increasing in numbers, but also in strength. And so to limit their population growth, the king of Egypt, Egypt gave the midwives this order. From Exodus chapter 1 verse 16. When you help the Hebrew women in childbirth and observe them on the delivery stool, if it is a boy... Kill him, but if it is a girl, let her live. But Shifra and Pua feared God, and they refused to do what the king of Egypt said. They deliberately disobeyed their leader's command, and they delivered each tiny newborn boy with all the skill and ability that they possessed. But before long, their disobedience came to the attention of the king. And he summoned them to come before them. And according to the Bible says this. Why have you done this? He asked. Why have you let the boys live? Now I don't know about you. But this is where Shifra and Pua. They just shine on the pages of biblical history. You see not only were they God fearing women. They were also pretty smart too. When they recognized their ability. Their responsibility to the leaders. They also understood God's law supersedes man's law. They knew that they could not sin against God by killing the Hebrew babies. And so according to the Bible, they said this. Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women, they said to Pharaoh. They are vigorous and give birth before the midwives arrive. Scripture tells us that God smiled on their courage and commitment to do what was right. And the Bible says God was kind to the midwives. And because the midwives fear God, he gave them families of their own. Sephra and Pua are powerful, though pretty obscure, examples of doing what is right no matter the cost. They were indeed what we would call salt of the earth people. When Jesus calls us to be salt of the earth, he also meant for us to preserve the teachings of the Bible, even in today's world. And now, folks, I don't know about you, but it seems to me in our society today and, and really even in our churches, 
We want to use everything except the Bible to get questions to today's questions that we have. We want to put, I don't know, we want to put human thoughts, human feelings, and human intelligence above the Bible. Folks, we don't worship the book, but we worship the one that the book points to. I love the pledge to the, to the Bible. A lot of churches do it during VBS. I've been thinking about making it a part of our worship, and it goes like this. I pledge allegiance to the Bible, God's holy word. I will make it a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path and will hide its words in my heart that I might not sin against God. Now that pledge comes from the book of Psalms, part of it from 119 verse 105 where it says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And part of it from the same chapter, verse 11. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. You see, folks, as, as salt of the earth people, we should value the Bible as God's holy word. And we should preserve that as God's holy word. A section, second function of salt is that it adds pizzazz. I don't know about you. I just like saying the word pizzazz. It's almost time to have a good old homegrown tomato sandwich. You know, you get two pieces of bread, some Duke's mayonnaise, pepper, and then you got to have salt. If you put salt on it, man, it is exceptional. It gives that sandwich pizzazz. If you try to eat it without salt, it's just, well, it's just not as good. You see, Christians, we are supposed to live with pizzazz, with excitement, with gusto, with vitality. Now, folks, I want to tell you something. If you eat popcorn with sugar on it instead of salt, well, that's a sin. And it should have been one of the big ten, but it didn't make it. And I don't know where that idea comes from, that Christians are long-faced, dismal. You see, when Jesus' birth was first announced, the angel said... Behold, I bring you tidings of great joy. And then Jesus said, I have told you all these things that your joy may be complete. Where did it come from that to be a Christian, you can't have a good time? You can't smile. You can't be happy. Oliver Wendell Holmes once wrote, I might have entered the ministry if certain clergymen I knew had not looked and acted so much like undertakers. There was a man on a cruise ship. His name was John, and he met another man. And the man that he met was supposed to be very good at guessing other people's occupation. So the guesser said to John, said, you see that man over there? He's a physician. So John got up, went over and asked him, and yeah, he was a physician. And he went back and he asked the guesser, he said, how would you know that? He said, well, he just looks like he's a man of compassion. So John points to another one. He thought it was a setup. So he points to somebody himself and he says, what about that guy over there? And, and the guesser said, he is either an attorney or a judge. So John went and asked him. And he was right. The guesser said, well, he has that look about him, that look of knowledge. Then John pointed out another man and said, how about that guy there? And the guesser didn't hesitate. He said, that guy's a preacher. So John went over and asked him, he said, uh, my friend over there says you're a preacher. And he, he's guessing on looks. Are you a preacher? The guy said, no, actually, I'm just seasick. That's why I look the way that I look today. We somehow have got to add pizzazz, excitement, gusto, enthusiasm back into being a believer in Jesus Christ. You see, we, we Christians, folks, we ought to be the most vibrant, joyful, positive, enthusiastic people on earth. And why? You need to hear this. Why? Say amen if you're awake. Because our past is forgiven, our future is secure, and we are filled with the greatest power in all of the universe, the Holy Spirit. And absolutely nothing can come our way that God and us cannot handle together, even a pandemic. With God, our possibilities are all the way off the chart. Secular folks need to look and see the joy that we have in our lives. 
We salty Christians, we need to demonstrate that, that people can have a wonderful time and still be right in their mind. You know anybody that when they show up, you think things are going to get interesting now. Or the party is about to start now because so-and-so has showed up. As I look through the characters in the Bible, there's a lot of characters that bring about pizzazz. But one of the greatest ones, I believe, is Peter. He brought pizzazz everywhere he went. And there's no significant figure, in my opinion, in the New Testament as relatable as Peter. He's always first on the list when we think about the apostles. He is also prone to be impulsive, rash, bold, and even cowardly. Peter is the first to declare Jesus to be the Messiah, the Son of the living God. He swears his undying loyalty to Jesus. He even cuts off an ear for Jesus. Then he is found cursing as he denies Jesus at his hour of crucifixion. Now while we may not love the cowardice of Peter, we love that, yes, we can relate to this guy. We love that even after the denials, the cursing, everything that Peter did, we love the fact that Jesus never gave up on Peter. The resurrection and Pentecost transforms Peter into the fearless church leader that we read about in the book of Acts. And also the patient shepherd that we encounter in his epistles. Despite his metamorphosis, you and I, we can still relate to him. He is someone that brought pizzazz. A third characteristic of salt is that it makes a person thirsty. Now, when I eat country ham, I like for it to be salty. I hope you do too. And then I drink water all day and I think, man, that country ham was too salty. Do you know why they sell peanuts and popcorn at ball games and at movies? So you'll buy more drinks. And you've heard the old saying, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. Well, that's true, but you can feed him some salt and hurry the process along. A king was, had three daughters, and he asked his daughters one time how much they loved him. And his first daughter said... Daddy, I love you more than all the gold in the world. The second daughter said, Daddy, I love you more than all the silver in the world. The youngest daughter, she was having a hard time coming up with something. And she finally looks up and she says, Daddy, I love you more than all the salt in the world. The king was kind of disappointed at his third daughter. But the castle cook had overheard this. And so the next day, he decided he was going to make a point in defense of this youngest girl. He fixed the king's meals without salt. The food was tasteless, as you can imagine. Then he understood what his daughter was saying to him. She was saying she loved him so much that without him, like salt in food, nothing was good. Folks, we salty Christians, we ought, we ought to make people thirsty for the living water, which is Jesus Christ. In the Bible, we read about David, who was called a man after God's own heart. And I believe he is a character in the Bible that we can relate to as well. One that should make us thirsty to be after God's own heart. To understand why David was a man after God's own heart, we need to see what characteristics he had to qualify for that description. In the book of Acts, the Apostle Paul speaks of God's feelings for King David. After removing Saul, he made David their king. He testified concerning him. I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. Folks, the answer to why David was considered a man after God's own heart is found right there. He did whatever God wanted him to do. Well, you may be thinking, you know, how could God call David a man after his own heart when he committed such terrible sins? Adultery? Murder? You see, we learn so much about the character of David in the book of Psalms. There, David opens up his life for all of us to examine. And we can look at the life of David and we can see that it was a mixture of success and failure. And it records that David was far from perfect. Or any of us, perfect. But what made David a cut above 
was that his heart always pointed to God. He had a deep desire to follow God's will and to do everything that God wanted him to do. He was a man after God's own heart. And I believe that should make us thirsty for God. Now, if I was to take a clear glass of water and pour it. Hear that water? Oh. Mm. Are you thirsty? Are you the only Christian in your office? Are you the only Christian in your workplace? Folks, if you are, don't feel sorry for yourself. I think then y'all look at that like hot dog. I've got the exclusive salt franchise right here in my office. And Jesus has trusted me to represent him to all these lost folks. What a privilege. I'm going to pass the salt. Sometime back, I was in a Bible study class and I learned that salt was added to dung to make a fire burn hotter. You see, it had to be mixed with something ugly to make a difference. The tragedy is that so often we Christians, we, we just never mix with anybody. We want to just stay in our own comfortable chairs. It's been said that we Christians, we practice frog evangelism. That is, that we sit on our front porches or in our churches waiting for someone to come within range. Studies have shown that after a new Christian becomes a believer, for about two years, they have the best shot at bringing non-believers to Christ. Now, I don't believe that our task is to go out and preach every morning, go preach in the office. I don't believe it's our task to reprimand pagans or to call our folks on the corner and ask them if they are saved. I don't think it's our task to take the Bible and stuff it down somebody's throat. I think it is our task to live so vibrantly, so positively, so winsomely, so joyful that folks will approach us and ask, what makes you tick? Why are you so happy? Where does your inner strength come from? And then you can say over a cup of coffee or wherever you are, you can say, look, my life turned around when Jesus Christ came into my life. When I accepted Christ as my Lord and Savior, things changed. Now, I still have a long ways to go, but Jesus has already brought me a long way. He has turned the light on in my life, and he can do the same for you. So folks, where you live, work, and play this week, please, please, in the name of Jesus, pass some salt. What the world needs now is more salty characters, salty Christians who will stimulate the spiritual appetites of anyone who comes in contact with them. You see, it takes very little effort to be tasteless in today's world. But God wants us to be salty characters. And not in the earthly sense, but in an enhancing sense. Christians, we, we believers, we should enrich the lives of others. We should have that engaging manner that causes people to comment about us. He is so refreshing. She is just delightful. Her face just makes her sparkle. Pass the salt, pass the salt. For God's sake, pass the salt. It's my prayer that we see more and more salty Christians that preserves God's holy word, adds pizzazz to the world, and brings a thirst for God. Let us pray. Father God, thank you so much for this passage of Scripture. May it speak to us today. May we become more salty for you. It's in your holy name that we pray. Amen. Seed and apple tree.
There's a song in every silence, seeking word and melody. There's a dawn in every darkness, bringing hope to you and me. From the past will come the future, what it holds a mystery, unrevealed until it sees on something God alone can see. is our beginning in our time infinity in our doubt there is believing in our life eternity in our death the resurrection at the last of victory unrevealed until it sees on something God alone can see Something God alone can see. <clears throat> and now receive this blessing. God calls us to be salt, to add flavor to the world. God calls us to be salt, to add pizzazz and beauty to the world. May we be salty Christians that produce a thirst for a relationship with Jesus Christ. Go in peace. Amen. <laughs>